Hello? Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Welcome aboard Frank's Magic Bus. For the next two hours, Frank Welch takes you on a musical journey with some of the best deep tracks of classic rock history. You'll hear this week's featured artist and a whole lot more. Now, without further ado, Frank Welch. Our feature artist this time around on the Magic Bus is Jethro Tull, and we're going to talk now with Ian Anderson, the leader of Jethro Tull. You know, they started back in 1967. Their first single, first album came out in 68. This was a surprisingly bluesy album, but at that time, all the British bands were doing bluesy stuff. Then they kind of changed their style. Ian Anderson got up front with his flute. Really, the only major classic rock band that where the front guy was the flute player. I mean, on all the songs, he just stood there with the flute and his one leg up in the air and sang. You know, Ian but extremely successful over the years and uh, still tours quite a bit. And we talked to Ian about that, about the popularity that continues with Jethro Tull that keeps them on the road quite a bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty busy, um, and I have to squeeze in also wedding in June, so I'm kind of busy guy. My goodness. Um, at the moment. Uh, this a little too busy, frankly. <laughs> a little too busy. do with uh, having a day off. It beats the alternative, I guess some would say, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, in, um, in the most recent U.S. Uh, Jethro Tull tour, now I know uh, you played uh, even towns like Fort Worth. Did you have a symphony, like the hosting city would have a symphony, or was that pretty much with just your band? Well, in the last Jethro Tull tour, I was a couple of weeks ago doing some shows, and prior to that, in, on tour in the, in the U.K., but that was just, that was just uh, Jethro Tull, Jethro Tull shows. Um, when I do the orchestral stuff, it's Ian Anderson playing uh, the uh, orchestral Jethro Tull, because... It's an acoustic performance, you know, working with an orchestra and, and the musicians that I work with doing the, the acoustic stuff are, are different guys, you know. I, I, Jethro Tull guys are rock musicians and they like to make a lot of noise and, and when I work with the orchestras, I need people who come more from the world of classical or jazz or folk backgrounds, people who are used to playing very quietly and fitting in with other acoustic musicians, so it's a different, different set of skills. Well, there's been a trend of classic rock artists going on the road and doing entire classic albums all the way through, and a few years ago, Ian and Jethro Tull performed the epic Aqualung album in front of a small, closed audience. We talked to Ian about that. Now, the Aqualung is the album that you've chosen to do live in the order it was redone originally. Are there any other albums you'd like to redo? What is your favorite Jethro Tull album? Well, the Aqualung album, I think, is certainly up there amongst the, the most uh, useful albums I've made, in the sense that it's, there's a lot of material on there that, that one way or another still features from time to time in the Jethro Tull set, or, or indeed even even arrangements of those songs that appear on uh, on the concerts I do with orchestras. I, I do Aqualung, Locomotive Breath, um, uh, Wondering Aloud. I mean, there's a, a few songs on the Aqualung album that I play when I do the orchestral shows. But, of course, there are other things like the song Budapest from Crest of an Ave, which is, uh, is one that readily lends itself to an orchestral accompaniment and, and, um, and uh, some of the material from the recent Jethro Tull Christmas album finds its way into the orchestral shows because there are some traditional classical and church pieces of music that I've done arrangements of, which uh, you know, are, are um, kind of natural ones for the orchestra to play, too. Uh, let's talk about this newly recorded Aqualung album. Now, you got uh, in front of a closed audience of about 40 or 50 people, and you mm -hmm. had your band do the entire album, right? That's right, yeah. We've got the CD, and it sounds fantastic, and we play it, and I'm surprised, I'm not just blowing smoke here, but I'm surprised at how fresh not only the instrumentation sounds of Aqualung and all the songs, but your voice, too. I mean, you, it's been a while, hasn't it? Well, that's right. Yeah, I mean, some of the songs are uh, are um, <clears throat> pieces that I regularly perform in concerts. Some of them were things that we rarely do, or in three cases, uh, songs we'd never played since we recorded them on the original Aqualung recording back in uh, 1970. And I noticed, looking at the credits, uh, the only name that rings a bell to me, being an old uh, Jethro Tull fan, is Martin. Martin Barr, the guitar player, has been with Jethro Tull since 60, well, since Christmas '68. Darren Perry, our drummer in Los Angeles, he's been with us uh, for 22 years. The keyboard player, Andrew Gidding, has been with the band for uh, 19 years. And Jonathan Noyce, the bass player, has been with the band for about 12 years. So, you know, it's the uh, same bunch of guys for a while. But, of course, when I'm doing the orchestral stuff, it's a different set of musicians who um, are people, again, that I've been playing with for a few years, but doing, you know, solo projects and other, other performances. So, um, you know, it's... Uh, it, it brings the total number of people that I've played professionally with up to uh, 
somewhere around about 30 people that have made up the members of of uh, of, of the bands that I played with over the years and um and I'm happy to say that they're all they're all my buddies, and that uh, from time to time I still get the opportunity to play with some of them, and that's that's great fun. And in one of the all-time great WTF moments in rock, if you recall in the late 80s, Metallica was the hot USA heavy metal band, and they were nominated for a Grammy in the hard rock heavy metal category. Well, guess who shocked the rock world and won? In fact, they didn't even show up to the Grammys because they figured they had no chance. Yes, it was Jethro Tull. Um, yeah, it was it was about eighty six, eighty seven. It was on that album that uh, infamously won the Grammy for hard rock, oblique stroke metal. Yes, um, yes, and uh, which is kind of an acu- curious anomaly, which did not go down well with the public or the particular supporters of Metallica, who um, who felt a little incensed, I suppose, that uh, that we won the Grammy and Metallica didn't that year, but. Um, yeah, it was just one of those things. We didn't win the Grammy really for being a hard rock band. We won the Grammy for being a bunch of nice guys that hadn't won a Grammy before. <laughs> and also because they still don't have a category in the Grammy Awards for best one-legged flute player. So <laughs> I just have to take what I can get. That is funny. Have you ever met up with Metallica? Have you guys ever talked about that? No, I've never, the never come across them. They, they, they kind of live in a different uh, part of the music spectrum to me. In fact, uh, I, I actually don't really get to see too many musicians. I once in a while I run into some folks, you know, if I'm doing a, you know, a festival or a TV show or something where there are other artists on the bill. But you know, I don't, um, I don't, I don't hang out with uh, with musicians. You see, I, I don't, I don't live in a city. I don't live in London.